So we just learned how to build a data science team. And now we're going to take a turn and understand how to use data um, that we have at our fingertips. As we all know, governments are using so much more data or have access to so much more data than they did before. So now we're going to take some time and really understand how to work with that data so it's most effective and uh, we can serve our, our um, constituents in the best way. To help us do that, we have a presentation from Inyaki Sagarzazu, as well as Tasmia Naz. At the end, we will have live Q&A with Tasmia. So let's get started um, and enjoy the session. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us uh, at our session, um, understanding the data at our fingertips. My name is Tasmia Nas. I am an applied data scientist on the public sector team here at Civis. I work with government agencies to build data pipelines and dashboards um, to draw insights on global malaria trends um, and inform key funding and programming decisions for the President's Malaria Initiative Project. Prior to joining Civis, I worked as a research analyst um, at Westat with federal public health agencies on tobacco health analytics and survey science. Hi everyone, my name is Inyaki Sagarsasu. I am an applied data science lead here in our public sector at Civis Analytics. Um, I joined Civis from academia. I used to be an assistant professor in political science. Um, since joining Civis, I've been in charge of um, some uh, work on our local and state clients, as well as on the Presidential Malaria Initiative. Um, as a lead, I get to manage people and projects on our public sector side. In this session, we're going to be talking about data and some of the opportunities and challenges that government organizations face with the abundance of data that exists in, in the world, um, and more specifically in their organizations. Uh, we're going to be talking about what is data, providing some um, ground definition of how we understand it. We're gonna be talking about different types of classification of data. How do we think of data from different angles? And we'll be talking about some of the places where to find data. So to start off with, uh, uh, some ground level definition, um, what is data? Well, I think the simple answer um, is everything is data. Everything can be data. If you think about your day to day and you record everything that you did throughout it, uh, the time that you woke up, uh, the time that you had breakfast or coffee or tea, um, uh, what time you left your house if you did, or if you want to do exercise or what you ate um, and everything, all of those steps, all of those things um, are going to be data points, right? Um, we think about this a large scale, right? Um, then uh, we have a, a massive amount of data, right? Um, a key thing here is that yes, everything is data, but then um, there's a point on which, which data is useful. Right, uh, which data can yield results when analyzed, and and for that, going from the initial point where everything is data to that um, uh, additional state of useful data, um, there needs to be some analysis and processing that needs to happen so that we get to a point where um, we can yield great results from uh, a data set. Right. Um, with some simple analytical methods. So um, what uh, when we think about this, um, this concept of data and um, the availability of it, we, we can talk about just the, uh, the amount of growth that the sector has experienced in the, in the last um, a few decades, right? Um, not just uh, growth in terms of uh, the amount of, of um, information available to turn into useful data, but also in the reduced, reduced cost 
that um, exist nowadays for um, using, obtaining, uh, and storing all that information, right? Um, so while on the one hand, uh, information has been increasing, on the other hand, we've seen a reduction in all of those costs that uh, make, um, make it simpler for organizations to um, find insights uh, and uh, use that information to, to generate uh, improvements, right? Um, this opens the opportunities for public sector organizations, um, uh, giving them the, the, uh, an easier way to improving efficiency of their services, um, finding ways in which they can uh, improve equity of access uh, to their services, right? In general, public sector organizations with the data that they that, that they have available or that, that, that they could potentially collect um, or obtain through other sources um, have a that opportunity to really change the way that they connect with their constituents. On the challenges side, however, um, we know that uh, analyzing data is not necessarily easy because not all the data is useful. And to be able to get from information points into useful data, um, a lot has to happen. A lot of, of steps that people often tend to ignore or, or assume that they're easy. A lot of those steps have to happen. Um, and to be able to, uh, to handle that amount of data that exists uh, nowadays, um, it poses a significant challenge in the public sector organizations to have the expertise and to have the tools to um, carry on that analysis. So having kind of level set on the data definition side, we can start thinking about different ways in which we can classify data. Right? Um, we're going to be talking about a few of these, uh, uh, looking at data from different angles. And so to start off, um, we can think of data just based on the subject that it talks, right? Uh, transportation data, uh, environmental data, uh, health data, education data, or financial data, right? Often in public organizations, these silos are uh, along um, um, structural divisions, right? The transportation department will have transportation data, whilst the public health department will have health data, um, and so on and so forth, right? Um, these are, are useful divisions of data. These are um, it's sort of like the most in, innate way that we think about data is amongst what is the subject that it falls under. Um, however, that can also hamper uh, our ability to obtain um, insights from, from the data, right? Um, and some of the opportunities here lay in um, connecting all those different sources of data in a way that allows analysts of different sectors to um, not just not just share the data, but share knowledge and um, obtain those mixed insights of how does um, meteorological data uh, merge with transportation data, merge with health data, and merge with financial data. Right? How do we get all those um, all those points together? Um, in terms of the challenges that we see here is how do we find a way to unify all those different uh, disparate data sources? How can we bring them all to one place where multiple people can talk about it or can look at it and provide analysis? There's challenges not just about where to centralize this information, but also about permissioning and how do we govern this data um, who gets access to what, um, et cetera. So um, that in and of itself is a challenge that many public sector organizations um, are finding themselves with. If we think about data more in the way that it comes to us, right, um, there's another way that we can classify it. And this is going to be based on how that data is structured, right, or not. Right. Data can come with uh, clear headlines or clear classifications where you know what um, that a name is a name, that a date of birth is a date, um, that uh, a zip code is a zip code, etc. Right. Um, you have columns with the limited data, uh, information, right? That you that its name, and you know what the information in that column will be, right? Um, 
that is the the most one of the most common ways in which we have data um, and it's what we typically find in relational databases or in many of the excel files that um, many people have uh, as data sources it's an easy to use mechanism right it's an easy to search mechanism uh, and is uh, how we tend to think of data most of the time uh, however like everything it's uh, it has some limits in that uh, with the advancement of the world and the way that things are moving, um, there's a lot of different data types that are not, uh, cannot fall into this description that cannot be put into Excel files. You cannot put images or videos into Excel files um, to analyze or into relational databases. So there are challenges um, in that in structure files that they don't uh, grow with the growth of the information that we've seen. And so uh, if we flip the coin from, from here, right, we have unstructured data, right? Um, unstructured data is going to be everything that is not structured data. It's going to be um, maps, and it's going to be videos, and it's going to be tweets, and it's going to be emails and transcriptions of meetings and um, all sorts of other types of um, either human or machine generated information that could be textual or that could be not textual. Um, all of that is going to be unstructured data, right? Um, it could have an internal structure, but for the most part, it doesn't, right? Um, there's a lot of this data. In fact, there's more unstructured data than structured data. And so um, there's an opportunity for government organizations to get to that information, right, if necessary. However, um, because of its lack of structure, because of, of its innate difficulty, it's um, much harder to um, search, to process, to analyze, right? It requires a lot more work to be able to gather insights from them. So um, it's it, no doubt it remains uh, a less used uh, source of information and insights. And with that, I hand it over to Tasmia to continue. So thank you, Anyaki, on uh, your great overview of key definitions of what is data, um, organizational sources of data, and data structures. So data is generally composed of multiple variables that are combined into a single file, which may come in different formats. One of these formats that data can come through is a flat file. A flat file database stores data in a plain text format, easily read by many applications, uh, such as Excel. Flat files are often stored as CSVs or text files, and they are widely used in data warehousing projects to import or export data. Some opportunities with flat files are that they have an uncomplicated structure. Because of this, they tend to have a smaller footprint, are easily storable and user, use fewer resources than their relational database counterparts. Some challenges are that flat files are typically used to describe a single table. For example, a single file is not able to hold multiple Excel sheets, and flat files are not effective for large-scale record keeping. Some problems that can arise with their use include the possibility of duplication and the difficulty of keeping records unique. Um, this can lead to wasted storage and levels of inefficiency. Um, it can be difficult to make changes in the format of the data entered um, and in the retrieval of any data that requires multiple queries. Another format that data comes in is geospatial data. Geospatial data is information that describes objects, events, or other features with geographic content. Shapefiles are the most common file system used. However, um, other types of files can be used, such as flat files. Um, uh, for example, latitudinal and longitudinal data coordinates can be stored in flat files. Um, high resolution images are also available, uh, for example, for raster data. Geospatial data often require special applications or tools for analysis. Um, some Several applications that can read geospatial data include uh, ArcGIS, open source GIS apps, PostgreSQL, um, R, and Python. 
So some opportunities with geospatial data is that um, geospatial analysis can help uh, generate hyper-localized findings, um, but geospatial data is often scarce and um, often not shared at low levels of aggregation. Um, so sometimes uh, data files and analysis um, are uh, done on inappropriate levels of aggregation. So, so far we've covered different ways to classify data. We covered data structure and file formats, but where are these different types of data found? Turns out data can be found through many different sources. Um, the examples that we have on this slide are definitely not all inclusive. We recognize that there are many data sources that we haven't included here. Um, so we divided up our sources by public sector data and um, all other sectors like private sector, nonprofit, academia. With the public sector, we divided it up into three levels. So there's local level, state level, and federal level. At the local level, um, local level governments uh, collect data on um, council minutes, um, community studies, employee directories, and travel or traffic advisories. At the state level, um, examples of data available can include uh, population demographics, job trends, and other economic trends in that state, um, financial uh, expenditure data for that state level government, and car crashes that are happening in that state. At the federal level, there's the US Census Bureau, which provides um, demographic data on uh, individuals in the US. There's also health and human services data, which includes data collected by the NIH, FDA, CDC, and other HHS uh, agencies. And there's also data.gov, which uh, includes information from all of these sources above and many other uh, data sources from other federal level agencies. In the private sector, we have um, companies such as Google and Wikipedia that are collecting um, a lot of information. There's also various social media companies that uh, collect information on both individuals and um, where individuals can uh, access data on their own um, social media trends and as well as other people's social media uh, uses and trends. And there are also other uh, apps and online services that collect data as well. At the nonprofit sector, we have examples like the Gates Foundation and Q Research Organizations um, that once they have uh, studies that are published, they will usually publish the research data backing those studies. In academia, we have various academic institutions that uh, conduct many different types of studies. Uh, one example is the Johns Hopkins COVID Resource Center that uh, provides up to date data on COVID statistics around the country and um, around the world. So um, some opportunities and challenges here with the public sector, um, as we saw governments collect a wealth of data across many services, across various agencies at different governmental levels and um, various topics that the different agencies touch. Uh, so there's just all of this data that the government has access to and collects. The challenges are that um, with this wealth of data that is collected, <clears throat> there are increasing uh, public demands for making this data um, open source and accessible for the public. So uh, what this brings a challenge of uh, creating institutional frameworks for data governance and also the data that is collected by the government often contain sensitive data that needs to go through de-identification. So there are always privacy risks when data that once contained personal identifiable information is released. Opportunities with private and third party data. Um, so businesses and non-governmental institutions, they often have unique capabilities and resources that the government may not so by uh, forming partnerships, both sides can really um, be able to leverage these, uh, their unique capabilities and resources and really be able to harness each other's data to make more data-driven decisions. Um, challenges include, um, so if the government were to access 
this personal data that is held by uh, businesses in the private sector, there is a risk of eroding public trust. So in order to mitigate that, there needs to just be more transparency on what information governments are accessing and how they are using that information to create public services. So um, as you saw, there is just a wealth of open data sources at our fingertips and a huge opportunity to harness public sector data and um, combine it with private and third party data sources. Rapid advances in technology and development of analytical tools and techniques in recent times means that we can now gather and share data in huge quantities. So these recent technological advancements have made it possible for data to have the transformative power for creating high quality public services. So we hope that our session was informative and in helping you identify some sources of data. And we hope that it gave you some ideas for synergizing the data that is available to your organization with data from other organizations to improve public sector services. Um, thank you for your time. And uh, we will now uh, open the floor up for some questions. Awesome. Thank you, Tasmia. I think um, provided so much information during that session. We know that we have some questions coming through. Um, the first one of which is, you know, when you're thinking about unifying data, how should an organization get started, right? I mean, it can seem like a really large task and to think about the volume of data, right? So how should they get started? But then also, what are some of the obstacles that they should watch out for to make sure that they're really successful as they move forward? Sure, thank you so much for that question. Um, so we know that at Civis, we work with a lot of different types of data sources. Um, a challenge that we come up with is, yeah, unifying all these different data sources. Um, so some challenges include um, combining uh, various data sources into a single source and then performing data cleaning. So um, one thing that's really important is having a uh, data analytics platform that organizes and stores data from multiple sources into a centralized source. Um, so some things to consider when you're looking for a um, analytics platform is to find one that offers pre-built integrations to common data systems um, and uh, some APIs, um, a, a platform that updates and adds information to improve the accuracy of your data um, and also uh, deduplicates your data. Thank you. Um, one of the things that you mentioned too that I just wanna go back to is this idea of privacy with data. Can you share some of your um, experience with working with clients and how they've managed the idea of privacy? Sure. Um, so I used to work with um, tobacco data where we uh, collected nationally representative um, uh, data on uh, tobacco use across the U.S. Um, that data initially, it's, um, you know, there's like personally identifiable information with that. Um, but in order to use that data and make uh, conclusions about um, the general population, um, we had to de-identify uh, that data. Um, you know, as people are, as we're collecting data from individuals, we really want to ensure that privacy um, and uh, yeah, to make that data public, it, uh, it's important to uh, apply those um, de-identification practices. Well, with that, I certainly want to thank you and Inyaki for providing such, um, I think, really important information as folks think about how to understand the, the vast data that they have and to work with that. Um, what we have coming up next is a session on understanding the buzzwords. So, you know, we've learned how to build a team. We've learned how to understand some of the data, but what comes on top of that is kind of working through the buzzwords and understanding how to place um, data properly, considering all of that. So that will be our next session and we look forward to you joining then. Thank you. Thank you so much.